it's um, a pleasure. Korea is very, very interesting and very fun. I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'll be here for two weeks, and I, I like to stay in the um, library coffee house, so if you need to come by and ask me questions or bother me, that's nice. <laughs> so um, today I'm talking about uh, two-dimensional orbifolds. Um, most of what I'm talking about is um, scattered around in various sources. So a lot of this is in um, Bill Thurston's lecture notes, which are available free online, chapter 13. So if, and if you want more reading sources, I can, I can give you some. And for the graduate students, I have some problems at the end of the class. Sorry, I'm here. So um, most of you have probably seen manifolds. So they're locally modeled on open sets in Rn. So the notation I'm using, you take some open set, I just call it ui tilde to emphasize that it's sort of covering it. And a little patch looks like this. And you put those patches together in a nice way. Now for an orbifold, this is really similar. Okay, it's, it's, you also have an orbifold atlas. I won't say all the details, but it's very similar. So you'll have a little patch, a UI tilde. But instead of just immediately taking a homeomorphism to your space, you're first going to mod out by some finite group of isometries. So you can get some more information here. So here, maybe I mod out by the group Z mod 4Z, and the action is just by rotation of this little disk. Okay, so what I'm going to get when I do that is what's called a, a cone point. Okay, so here's a fundamental domain for that action of, of uh, rotating, order four rotation. All right, and so this looks kind of like a cone, and you can actually make this out of a piece of paper. So it looks like a little cone. There's not as much angle here, and that's another thing we'll be counting as we go along. So normally at a point here, there's an angle two pi around, but here there's just angle pi over two. It's a quarter of the normal area. So this is called a cone point of order four. Okay, and this is the thing that's mapped homeomorphically to my orbifold. So maybe I have an orbifold and this notation will um, maybe have like a four, a four, and a two here. So that's mapped to, so this little patch here is mapped right to this little patch here homeomorphically. Okay, so this map factors through this quotient. Okay, so there, this is sort of some more information than a manifold. So a manifold is an example of an orbifold where this group is just a trivial group at all points. Okay, and then just like in a manifold, I have some notion of compatibility for my charts. I have to have the same thing going on for orbifolds. Okay, so if I have the intersection, like if two little patches have a point that maps to the same thing, they need to have tiny little neighborhoods around them where this map is identical. Okay, so for this, if I have a point, it, it might not be a big, it might just be a, a map that, a, a little neighborhood that falls inside one of here. Okay, so I get this. All right, so, but it's best really to think about examples, so I'm gonna try to do a lot of examples today. It's the main, the main thing I'm gonna do. So this is called S2244. This is because the underlying space is a sphere and there's three current points of orders two, four, and four, and I'll, I'll define all this later. I just want to start with what's going on. Okay, so a geometric, so this is a local, this is a local property, just like being a manifold is a local property. You can't see the whole thing, you're just defining it on little local charts. So a geometric orbifold is one where you take a Riemannian metric with a manifold with a metric on it, and you take some discrete group of the isometry group of that manifold. And then you quotient out the whole manifold by that action. So this is often called a branched cover. So um, orbifold covers are really a generalization of branch cover, something that's studied a lot in complex analysis and is very useful. In fact, um, it used to be that branch covers were studied more than covers. Um, so here's a, a simple example. This is called the football, because it's shaped like a football. You t just take S2, you quotient out the whole S2, by a group of order four, which fixes the north and south poles. Okay, so this isn't a, a manifold covering map. It's a branched cover. 
if you're a complex analyst or an orbifold covering. And then downstairs I have an orbifold with two order four cone points. Because there's going to be little neighborhoods around here that look like the quotient of a disk by an order four action. Okay, so this is an example. Another example um, that I wanted to do to mention some reflections. Now also I wanted to mention reflections is this. So what if I just have, so this is a spherical orbifold that I just made an example of because it's a geometric orbifold and it's the quotient of a sphere, so I'll call it a spherical orbifold. So I also have Euclidean orbifolds that are going to be the quotient of Euclidean space. So I can just take this group here, which is going to be reflections in these lines. So I can make the group reflections in the lines. Okay, acting on E2. So here's a, re I have a metric, right? So that's why, and that's isometries of that metric. Okay, so what's my quotient orbifold going to be? Okay, so it looks like a, it's fundamental, what's its fundamental domain? That's right, square. Okay, good, so here's a fundamental domain. Okay, so now why is this an orbifold? Why can I get little patches all over this? And it's sort of shining out. A lot of people draw them like this because these are mirrors. So these are called mirrors. Okay, and they act just like mirrors in the real world. So if you were in this orbifold, you would see it would be like there's mirrors everywhere. Okay, so this orbifold, it's got a little patch. So these patches here are locally modeled. They just have the trivial group. These little patches here, how is this model? So this looks like it has boundary, but it really doesn't, right? Because this is modeled on this little, this little disk, modulo Z mod 2Z, right? But the action doesn't act by a rotation here, it acts by reflection. Okay, so I just reflect off of here, and then I get this little mirror boundary. And then that's mapped in homeomorphically. Okay, so these, this is a reflection, so I only mentioned cone points before, but there's also reflectors. And there's, what about these things? What is this modeled on? This little patch. This is going to be modeled on uh, Z2 plus Z2 action, right? So I just have a reflection and another reflection, and they meet at right angles. Okay, so that goes down to, like this, where I have a Z2. Eventually I'll get sloppy and just write Z2 in just a minute. I'll probably do that. But I mean the same thing, Z minus Z. Okay, so, and this is called a corner reflector. This is another example of Euclidean orbifold. Okay, geometric orbifold. Okay, what was this supposed to remind me to do? This is supposed to remind me to do another one that's just like this. Okay, so this is exactly the same, but I just do reflections in the sides and these lines, okay? And the, here the lines are going to meet at angle pi over 3. Okay, again, a fundamental domain is just this triangle. Okay, here it's modeled on a little disk modulo or reflection. Okay, same here. And then at these corners, it's mo modeled on a little disk modulo a dihedral group. Okay, because two lines that intersect with an angle pi over n, they generate a dihedral group of order 2n. Okay, those are generators for the dihedral group. So th this is a, a, another reason, so this, this whole series of talks is really mainly an advertisement for orbifolds. <laughs> so one reason that they're so good is because they help you understand complicated groups. So um, a lot of people have done um, generalizations of orbifolds um, to understand groups that are built from other types of groups built up together. So here's a way that this whole group is built from these dihedral groups and the dihedral groups are connected along these Z2s. Okay, so this is a way to think of groups. So this local group here is D3, the dihedral group of order 6. Here it's Z mod 2Z and here it's trivial. 
Okay, and again, it looks like this shining triangle with mirrors on the sides. That's the orbifold. Okay, so I've been saying all these things without actually um, defining them. But so the ramification locus, so let me make these definitions a little more explicit. The ramification locus is the set of points where the local group is non-trivial. Okay, so if, I, if I'm a manifold, then the ramification locus is the empty set. So a manifold is also an orbifold, it just has trivial ramification locus. So for this example here, the ramification locus is this whole blue part. Try to draw the ramification locus in blue. When I did the, like, oh, I forget which one I did, 244, four, with this orbifold that was just had some cone points, then the ramification locus is just these three points. Okay, it's all the points where it's non-trivial. The underlying space is I just forget the ramification locus. Right, so when people talk about branch covers, what they really mean is an orbifold cover where I'm going to forget the names of the ramification locus. Okay, and I all, they only let you have branch, they only let you have cone points. Okay, so orbifold cover is a little more general. But I'll say I'll define that explicitly in a minute. Okay, is everybody okay with those two? So what's the underlying space of this orbifold? What if I forgot this ramification? I forgot that it was blue. Similar to the underlying space of that one. No, close. <laughs> the underlying space. Just if I just didn't see the blue, I just thought about it. So what was it? It was it was this square, right, with these mirrors. But I'm going to forget that. So its underlying space is. It's really hard. Okay, let's do this one first. What's the underlying space of this? What if I forget these three points here? Okay, let's go back. Let's do this one first. What's the underlying space of that one? That's a sphere. That's exactly right. So I forget these, this information and I have a sphere. Okay, and also for the underlying space of this, this is also a sphere. Okay, so this is, and this is an example of why the underlying space is sometimes like radically different from the actual orbifold. So what's the underlying space of this? What if I take one of these squares? What is that topologically? It's just a disk. That's right. Okay, so that's weird, right? Because this is a closed orbifold. Okay, it's not an orbifold with boundary. It's modeled on sets in R2, not R2 with boundary. Okay, but the under, when I forget this ramification locus, I only see a disk. Okay, so that's sort of a warning that the underlying space is, doesn't tell you, sometimes like the geometry is often very different. Like you can have a hyperbolic orbifold where the underlying space is spherical or Euclidean or something else. And also, it, the topology can change. Okay, so you have to be a little, little careful about that. So the, this boundary here is ramification locus. So this is considered a closed orbifold. Okay, so you know you have manifolds with boundary. They're modeled on points in you know you have a line in half space, right? Closed half space. But here these are modeled on little open sets. Okay, so. So the space is open. The underlying space is actually just closed. It's just this disk. It's D2. Closed disk. That's right. Right. So I just forget this information. I keep all those points. So it's the exact same set of points, but I forget the information. So I forget the group. But it changes a lot when you forget that information. Okay, good. Okay, so I already sort of said this, but let me just say it more formally. There's only for two orbifolds, which is one reason I'm focusing on them today, there's not that much that can happen. So there's uh, cone points. Okay, so I did some examples of those. There's corner reflectors. Those are the hardest ones. That's where the local group is actually a dihedral group of order 2n. Okay, generated by reflections and two lines meeting at an angle pi over n. So whenever you have a reflection group, that's so scary. <laughs> reflection group and you have lines meeting at some angle, you know that at the corner there you have a corner reflector. 
and then just the mirror, the mirror boundary, that's when you have reflections. Okay, so that's going to look like boundary, but it's not really boundary. It's still considered a closed orb of fold. Or a uh, orb of fold without boundary. It might not be actually closed. It, this one is compact, but it might not be compact. I'm not compact examples. Okay, so let's do some more examples. Let's do another Euclidean one. I'll get to hyperbolic ones in a minute. Now I don't have a watch. So is that time correct? Except for the hour? Uh, <laughs> no, it's 422 now. Okay, I can, I can translate. Okay, <laughs> so let's look at... Let's look at this. Um, okay, so here is a group of isometries of E2. I've got E2 again. Okay, so and I'm gonna so the first two translation to the left by one and translation up by one. So if I just took the group generated by that, I'm gonna get a torus. So I'm very happy with that. But I want to take an interesting a fundamental domain for that. Okay, I want to take one. So this is like the unit lattice, and I want to take if this is zero. I want to take one that's sort of like this. This is still a fundamental domain because it shifts by one and it shifts up by one. Take the group generated by that and it's inverses. Okay, what's going to happen when I rotate by pi about zero, zero? Okay, so that's going to put some torsion in my group of isometry, so I'm going to have some non-trivial ramification locus. And what's going to happen? So I'm definitely going to have one point fixed here in my ramification locus. And then what other point is going to be fixed by this action? Because some of these points in this fundamental domain are identified. All right, so this rotation by pi, it's going to take these two points and move them over here, these two points and move them over there. But what is that point there? This point. This point is the same as what other points on this fundamental domain? What points are identified here? Just by this on the torus action, this going to here and the bottom going to top, all these four points are actually the same point in the downstairs torus. Right? So when I rotate by pi, I'm fixing that point too. It doesn't look like it here. But this point is fixed. It's all the same point. It's going to itself. Okay, and there's two more that are actually fixed. You see those? So this point, under this rotation by pi about the or so this is the origin, is going to go to this point. But that's actually the same point in the quotient torus. Okay, so that's fixed. And then the same thing's happening for, I'll call this one right, this point is the same point as this point, but that's fixed by rotation. Okay, so I actually have four points, uh, one that's white, one that's blue, one that's red, and one that's green that are fixed by this action. Okay, so now, so this is uh, order two rotation, so the fundamental domain is going to be half the size. So I can take a fundamental domain to be, say, this one. Okay, so before for my torus, I had a fundamental domain with that. I'm taking a two-fold quotient of that by this rotation, so my fundamental domain is going to be half the size. So now I've got this fundamental domain, and what happens is it just folds up here. Okay, so I've got a famous orbifold, one of my favorites. This is my favorite orbifold. <laughs> and the reason I like this, um, it, it comes up in a lot of different contexts. So I'll be hearing a talk on some other different topic and I'll be kind of slightly falling asleep in the back. And someone will mention this orbifold and I'll be like, oh, I know all about that and then I'll listen. So it makes me excited. <laughs> it comes up a lot of places actually. <laughs> So what, what is this orbifold? This is called the pillowcase. <laughs> so it has four cone points. And also you can see the cone points of order two coming here because the, 
the angle, so remember I sort of mentioned at the beginning, the angle is not going to be in that first example of a cone point of order four, the angle was like a fourth of what it should be to go around. So for this point, when I fold this up, this angle is just pi. It's half of what it should be for a manifold point. And these two points are identified, so the total angle around these two points is also um, pi, which is half of what it should be. So that's a cone point of order two. And then same for here. I've got an angle of pi traversed there, and here I've got an angle of pi. So each of these are cone points of order two. So when I fold this all up, okay, I'm going to fold up this fundamental domain, and I'm going to get a um, four cone points all of order two, and then a red one. Okay, and these are two, 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 two. Okay, so this is called S2. Then I'll, I still haven't explained this notation, but you might be guessing what it is. S2, two, 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 the pillowcase. Okay, so this is a Euclidean orbifold, and this comes up in a lot of different contexts. It'll come up later when I'm talking about not complements, for example. So how come you fold it? the upper left edge and lower left edge? Um, let's see if, if I can show what, how those are identified. So this this one, so it's not directly. So this one, yeah, this is one. Okay, so how is this? So this is identified to this one, and then when I do this rotation, let's see. Yeah, that's identified to this one, and so I fold like that. Okay. And then same for here, I have to do a little trick for that, but they, they, they glue up. Okay, good. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a notation, finally, that I've been using. So what you do is you take the underlying space, so this, um, those little absolute value of an orbital fold, they just use that to denote the underlying space. So you take the underlying space, so for a two orbital fold, and then you list out all the cone points in a little list. You write a co colon, and you list out all the corner reflectors. Okay, so that tells you the notation. So here's some examples we've seen so far. S2, 2, 2, 2, 2. two. Thank you. <laughs> the two torus. S2, 2, 2, 2, two infinity. So I wanted to put this here because um, that infinity means there's just a cusp. Okay, so you can think of a cone point as an angle getting, as it, you're sort of stretching it out more and more and more and more. When you go to infinity, you've actually taken that point off to infinity so it doesn't exist anymore. So that's like you've removed a point that's a cusp. That's a notation for a cusp. And I'll show you that example in a minute. And then we saw D2 with three corner reflectors of order three. That was the one where I had the triangle. And then S2, 5, I haven't talked about that yet, but I will. So that's just underlying space S2 and one cone point of order 5 on it. That's an orbital fold. Okay. So, any questions? All right, so what's an orbital fold covering? Okay. So an orbital fold covering is a continuous map. So let me just say all this to get into your details, and then I'll give you some examples to make it more clear between the two underlying spaces, so that gives me a map between the two sets, where each point has a neighborhood. Okay, so normally in a cover, remember the definition of a cover, each point would have a little open set where the free images were just several open sets that each mapped homeomorphically down to it. Here it's a little different, so you could have that. You could have just some that were uh, mapped homeomorphically, or you could have a little, or some branching going on there. Okay, and so that's generalized as you could have a subgroup of your group. So each, so remember, each point's got a neighborhood that looks like an open set modulo some group of isometries, some finite group of isometries. And so it might look like, and this GI might be like the identity, so I could just have a, little disk covering a cone point of order 4 and that would be a covering of order 4. So it would just rotate by order 4 there and map down. Okay, and then a default cover, I have to say what I mean by a default cover. So normally for a cover you just count the number of little patches that map down to it. But here I need to say, oh well maybe 
there's some uh, group action going on there and I need to account for that. But it's just what you think. You can take a regular point and just count the pre-images, it's fine. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's do this example right here. Okay, so remember I talked about how this, if I, if I hadn't added my rotation, this was just a torus. So when I mod out by translation to the right and translation up by one, then I get a torus because this side glues to that and that side glues to that. So I get this torus. Okay, and this is going to be a cover of this orbifold. So let me draw this a little bit differently so you can sort of visualize what's happening here. Um, so I've got like white, green, blue, red. Okay, so how am I getting this cover? So these are all supposed to be cone points of order two. This is exactly the same as this picture right here. I just sort of bended it up a little bit. This is a, this is still has underlying space of sphere. Okay, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take this, this is one reason it's my favorite orbifold, because I'm gonna skewer it with a skewer, barbecue skewer like this. It hits this in four points. Okay, and then I'm just gonna rotate it by order two, and I'm gonna take that quotient. Okay, what happens, I've got these four, so over here, these little patches, this one's actually on the back. They have two little normal patches, just like a cover, the pre-image. But here, what's the pre-image of like this? What's a little patch around here? This is covered just by this patch, but it's order two. Okay, so it's covered by this little UI going down to this cone point of order two. Okay, so this is the other kind of covering that can happen in an orbifold cover. Okay, here's some orbifold covers. Two, two, I just did that one. Oh, and here's a further one, so I can take this. Alright. I can arrange my cone points. Two, 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 two. I can skewer it again. I love to skewer. I can skewer it again. I can rotate out by order four, which I did at the very beginning of the lecture by itself. And now what am I going to get? I'm going to get two points of order four. Oh, this picture. And how many points of order two do I have left? And I rotate by order four. How many do you have left? I have one. Good. Okay, so this is S2222 covering S2244. And you, similarly, you can have this torus covering S2244. Okay, so one of your homework problems for the graduate students is to figure out how to do that here with this picture. What, what other things should I add in to make this cover work? All right, similarly, I can take 236. I can just do a reflection. Okay, so I have a sphere and I have three cone points on the sphere. I can do a reflection in the plane containing those three cone points. And I can get something whose underlying space is a disk, but it has three corner points. Okay, and I can do S2 going to S2244. I'm going to have to erase my favorite orifold picture. And this is just a dihedral covering. So this is a spherical orbifold. So I have S2. And this goes to the football. Okay, now I'm just going to skewer that again, rotate. Oh. So these two four points are going to match up and I'm going to get two, two, four. Okay, because those fours map to each other. So the pre-image of this little cone here in this cover is just two little orbifold patches. Okay? Okay, so a theorem which I won't prove is that every orbifold has a universal cover. What's the uni what do I mean by universal cover? A cover that covers all other covers. 
Okay, and then I can define the orbifold fundamental group to just be the group of covering transformations of the universal cover. Okay, where again, for covering transformations, I've totally stopped looking at my notes. <laughs> I just mean this. So it's just the same definition of covering transformations. Things that make this commute. Okay, so F to itself. The covering transformations are the same definition. So I can do a homeomorphism of the top and the same quotient that doesn't change the, the actual cover. Okay, and it's a little easier to think of the group of covering transformations as this group. So here this group is a dihedral group. Okay, so an orbifold is good if it's covered by a manifold, otherwise it's bad. This is terrible notation, but it is stuck. <laughs> good and bad. So what are some bad orbifolds? <laughs> Here's a bad one, the teardrop. This is bad, and it's actually sad because it's a teardrop. So the teardrop is like I can put something here, say five, so S25, which I mentioned. Here, all right, so this has one con point. It's perfectly good orbifold. Every, everything's got a little neighborhood that looks like it's supposed to. This looks like a little disk modulo rotations of order five. The, all these points just look normal. These fit together. I can just make this identity here. Subgroup's just identity. It's fine as an orbifold. But it's bad. It's not covered by any manifold. Because this curve here bounds a disk on this side so it has to lift. Right? And this, if it's going to if it's going to be covered by a little patch, the only way this cone point can be covered by a patch is if it is unwrapped by order five. So that means this curve cannot lift. Okay, so you need a, a little more argument to make that precise, but that's the reason why this is bad. Similarly, if these numbers are, here's another bad one, as to like um, four or five is also bad. Okay, so these are the bad orbifolds. Okay, so let me um, say something about hyperbolic orbifolds. So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, so Mobius transformations are just maps of the form Z goes to AZ plus B over CZ plus D, and such that those are all complex numbers. And I want AD minus BC to be equal to 1. Now I can put them in one-to-one -one correspondence with PSL2C, just by saying this map is going to go to this matrix. So the AD minus BC is going to make that equal to 1. All I really need is for this not to be equal to 0, because notice if I multiply the rows both through by, say, 5, it'll change the determinant of this matrix, but it's not really going to change this, um, this transformation. So that's why you projectivize. So you don't have to projectivize when you're doing computations. So um, Mobius transformations can be um, decomposed into simple ones. Just translation. So Z goes to Z plus DC. Inversion. So what's the Z goes to 1 over Z? So I'm thinking about the complex plane. So inversion in a, the unit circle is Z goes to the complex conjugate of 1 over Z. So in okay. So I want to compose inversion in the unit circle with reflection in the um, in the real uh, line. Okay, so that gives me that one. So notice that one was a composition of two reflections in circles, if I consider circles generalized so that lines are circles. Okay, so the, um, these are all, and then dilation and rotation, translation, all of these can be generated by an even number of reflections in circles, and where I include lines in my circles. So really the full group, so some people call the Mobius group the full group, there's a little bit of, in the literature it's a little different, so be careful. The full group 
of uh, you know, isometries of H3 or the full Mobius group with the orientation reversing ones is a group just generated by reflections in circles. And then PSL2C, as I said it, is the index to orientation preserving subgroup of that. And then the ones that preserve isometries of H2, which I haven't even told you what H2 is yet, is the ones that meet the boundary of H2, which is just this line here. So I want to take inversions and circles that meet the boundary in at right angles. Okay, so these are the geodesics in H2 and the group of isometries, full group of isometries is generated by those inversions in circles which meet the boundary. There's a boundary which equals the real axis. So here's H2. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. That's a full group of isometries. And then the ones that are orientation preserving are the ones which meet the boundary at right angles. And so it's an exercise to show that that's actually PSL2R. Right, so here's an example, much better than the one I drew on the board, of some geodesics. So all those parts of circles, those are all circles that meet the boundary of upper half space at right angles. And they, um, and so I want to look at things that are generated by inversions in all those circles. Those are just some. This happens to, to work for a particular group, which I'll describe in a minute, for a particular orbifold group, which I'll describe in a minute. So H2 is exactly the points in the complex plane such that the imaginary part is greater than zero, up or half space. And the isometries are PSL2R, but really you should think of that as compositions of reflections and circles which meet the boundary at right angles. That's a geometric way to think about it. So when you're doing computations, you might want to use PSL2R, but when you're, when you're just getting some intuition, you want to think about reflections in these circles. Okay, and this metric is scaled by the height, so it's the regular metric in the complex plane, but scaled by the height. Okay, and the real line is actually not there, so those are all infinite geodesics. Okay, so what, what is it? This is supposed to represent some type of orbital fold. Okay, just like I had the pictures for S2222, had some tiling. So here's the group that's going to act on the upper half plane. So my first um, generator is Z goes to negative 1 over Z. So. So this is going to be composition of this inversion in this unit circle. Okay, and I got negative 1 over z, so I'm going to compose that with reflection in the line, the real part equals 0. Okay, with the vertical line through there, with reflection. In the line, real part of z equals zero. Okay, so what does that do? Okay, so first of all, it's going to fix i there, which is labeled by one, that's the height. It fixes i, and it's going to interchange those two sides. So it glues those two sides together, exactly like what was happening in S2222, my favorite rope of gold. Okay, and then what's the next one is just translation by one, so that takes the two sides together. So you hardly, you see this group a lot, people talk about this group, it comes up in everything, but people hardly ever talk about the fact that this is an orbifold group. So this is really a natural structure of an orbifold. So if you look at the angle here, so the angle at I in this fundamental domain, you only have pi, this is a geodesic, so that angle is actually pi. You don't have 2 pi, you have half of what you should have. So you're going to have a 2. So you have like a 2. And how much angle do you have here? Okay, well you've got pi over 3 plus pi over 3. So you've got 2 pi over 3, you have a third of what you have. So you have, this is a 2, 3 infinity orbifold. fold. So whenever anyone's talking about the modular group, they're really talking about an orbifold. And a lot of times, even in the literature, they say, oh, the quotient by this is a sphere. 
or disk, sorry. So its underlying space is an open disk. That's right. But th the real structure is of an orbifold. It's S2, 2, 3, infinity orbifold. Okay, so it's an open disk, yeah? Is that reflection to the origin? Uh, yeah, composition inversion in the unit circle, that's right. In the unit circle. With reflection in the line, real part of s reflection in this line that goes like this. So what happens when I do inversion in the unit circle, I get this. Right, but I want negative, right? So I need the need this part to change. Yeah. Okay, good. Any more questions? Yeah? What B? A is completion of inversion. B is just translation. Z goes to Z plus one. The translation is in PSL2Z. Uh, yes, translation is in PSL2Z. Because it Z goes to Z plus 1. So it's like, um, so how can I write that as AZ plus B over CZ plus D? I can write it as 1, 1, 0, 1. So, uh, yeah, Z plus 1. Z plus 1 over 1. There's a matrix. It's a translation. Okay, good. Okay. So, I don't know why this is all blue. Did I do something? Okay, so here's a group. So what am I doing here? So I should definitely draw something. I'm just describing a group and I want to kind of, I didn't want to draw the picture right away because I want you to, I just wanted to have it appear. We'll see the picture in a minute. Oh, no. okay. okay, so this is supposed to be upper half space. And here I have zero, negative one, one. Okay, so these are circles of radius one half, so this only goes up to a half. Alright, so let's think how these, how this group acts on hyperbolic space. All right, so let's look at, so what is this transformation? We have two, one, one, one. So this is Z. It's going to go to two Z plus one all over uh, Z plus one. That's what this linear fractional transformation is when I translate. So what happens to, which points do I want to do? Negative one, negative one is going to go to infinity. Okay, so here's negative one. So I want to figure out where these geodesics go to. So I haven't proved it, but Mobius transformations take geodesics to geodesics. So I'm just going to figure out where the endpoints go, and then I'll know where the geodesics go to. Okay, so negative 1 is going to infinity somewhere. Let's see what happens to 0. 0 is going to, looks like, 1. Okay, so this geodesic here is mapping to the geodesic through infinity to 1. So it's mapping here, so it's gluing those two geodesics together. Okay, what about the other one? What's the other one? Uh, one, 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 two. What's that going to do? That's going to take, which ones did I do? Did infinity. Okay, so this is z goes to what? z plus one all over z plus two. So where's infinity going to go to? Sorry, z plus two. So as I get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, how can I tell the difference between z plus 1 and z plus 2? I can't, right? So this is 1, exactly, good. That's going to go to 1. And then what other point did I want to do? Um, negative 1. Here, what's going to happen to negative 1? Um, that's going to go to 0. Okay, so, in fit, so the axis infinity to negative 1, which is this axis, which I'll draw maybe like this. Right, so negative 1 is going to 0, so this is going to this axis right here. This is a little hard to tell in this picture, but this is a punctured torus, because I have this side going to this side, this side going to this side. All these four points here 
the infinity, these are all identified and that'll become the puncture. None of them are actually in the space. These are all holes. And then there's one at infinity. Okay, so now, what, okay, so we have this, this is the analog of the torus, but it's a hyperbolic punctured torus. Okay, so now I want to add in this rotation about I. So this is about one half, so I is like here. Okay, so what's going to happen here? There's, I'm going to have some fixed points. I'm going to have a fixed point here. I'm going to have a fixed point here. This is something you have to think about. And I'm going to have another fixed point here. This will be so much more obvious in the next slide when I change the... So I'm going to have three fixed points. This is going to be taken to itself. And the quotient is... S2, 2, 2, 2, two infinity. So let me explain that. There's a better picture of hyperbolic space that makes that more obvious. You can work this out. So this rotation about I is exactly this translation, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, which turns out to be what when I make that a Mobius transformation. Z goes to 0, Z plus 1 over negative Z. So it goes to negative 1 over Z, or old friend, negative 1 over Z. That's what that same translation is. So you can work through that those work out, or you can translate everything to the unit disk. Okay, so that often helps a lot. That's one reason why I want to do this example. When I translate everything to the unit disk, so I'm going to have those two translations will become this side gets glued to that side, and this side gets glued to that side, and rotation about I, so I'll just conjugate it to get a... Uh, transformation of the unit disk become rotation about the origin. So then I have the fixed points will be this origin will be fixed of order 2. This point which is the same as that point that will be fixed of order 2. And this point which is that point which will be fixed of order 2. So when I rotate by pi by the origin this is much more illustrative picture. And in general it's usually better to look at this picture. This is sort of what I'll use from now on. Although for doing computations it's a little easier to work in that upper half space. Okay, so that's an orbifold S2222. Oh, and like, there's also an orbifold cover going on here. Very similar. So I have a puncture torus pushing down to a skewer this and then the skewer doesn't hit anything going up that way. I rotate by order 2 and then I get this S2, 2, 2, 2. Okay, good. Okay, orbifold Euler characteristic. So this is another reason that everyone should study orbifolds. <laughs> so the um, Euler characteristic is useful, super useful. Use it all the time, classifying surfaces. We can also use it for orbifolds. So instead of, so we're going to mod out by the local group. So we're going to take, so we're going to take a cell division of my orbifold. I switch from O to Q, but that should be okay. I take a cell division of my orbifold, but I'm going to take a special cell division. I'm going to require that the local group in every cell be the same. Okay, so if I have an edge, it's a reflector edge, I can take that. All right, and if I have but the endpoints, the endpoints, um, the cone points, they need to be points of that cell division. Okay, so in the interior of each cell, they have to be the same. Okay, so I could have an edge going from a cone point to a cone point, and they could be different order of cone points, but those need to be vertices. Those cone points need to be vertices. Okay, so and then I'm just going to take the regular orbifold order characteristic, but I'm going to divide by the size of the group. And why is that? That's the correct notion for size. So order characteristic is some notion of size. And when I mod out by some group, I want to say, oh, it's really not a whole cell. It's just like an eighth of a cell because I modded out by a group of order eight. There. And this will also give me the right, this orbifold order characteristic was cooked up to work well for covers. Okay, so here's a formula. So what happens when I take the regular, um, so suppose I just have an orbifold with cone points. 
So this is what's normally restricted to. So I just take the Euler characteristic of the underlying space where I forgot, remember I forgot the ramification locus, so I forgot those numbers. And then, so remember I required that my cone points be vertices, so I'm just going to remove those. So that those will remove M. But then I'm going to add in 1 over PI because I added in just a, a fraction of what was added in for a point for that cell. So that cell was weighted with a fractional rate. So I take it out, I do, I just do the orbifold Euler characteristic the normal way, take it out and then put it back in, but just a little bit back in. So this is an easy way to calculate the orbifold Euler characteristic without having to do a cell division, because you, you already know the, the Euler characteristic for surfaces very well. Oh, that is a great question, and that's one of your homework problems is to do that for the other type. So I'll just, I just gave you the formula for this one, but there is a secret formula for corner reflectors. Very good question. And so your homework is to figure out how you need to adjust the Euler characteristic when there's reflections. Good question. Okay, so this is the easiest case of the formula. Okay, so wh why is the Euler, orbifold Euler characteristic like the Euler characteristic? Well, for one reason, if I have a manifold, note that it's the exact same definition. Okay, because all those groups are going to be one. Okay, so for one way, it behaves nicely with respect to cover. So if I have a cover, then the orbifold Euler characteristic is multiplicative with respect to that cover. Okay, and then also I have a gauss binet I'll just state it here for hyperbolic orbifolds. The area is just negative 2 pi times the Euler characteristic. So one way you could prove this easily for, for um, hyperbolic orbifolds is just you know if you believe the formula for hyperbolic surfaces, then Selberg's lemma tells you that every um, group of hyperbolic isometries has a finite index torsion-free subgroup. So if I take some hyperbolic orbifold, by definition that's the quotient of hyperbolic space by some group of isometries. I didn't give you that definition, but that is what it is. And then I take a subgroup that's torsion-free, and that's going to give me a hyperbolic surface. I know the orbifold Euler characteristic holds for that. And then I know that for a default cover, the Euler characteristic behaves well with respect to that cover, so this gives me this formula. So you can get that formula right from that. Okay, so let me just quickly go over um, how the orbifold Euler characteristic can tell you that the, there is a smallest area hyperbolic orbifold. So there is a, a smallest area hyperbolic manifold. What's that one? Just genus 2. That's as low as I can go. Okay, you can go lower for orbifolds, but there's still a smallest one, very similarly. And that's because, that's basically because the orbifold Euler characteristic behaves discreetly. Okay, so if I had a surface, so if I had a surface, what would be wrong? So the Euler characteristic would be less than negative 2. So, if I have a surface, then I know that the overflow Euler characteristic is less than negative 2. So that's true. That's, that's less than negative 142. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, what if I had, what do I do next? What if I had some genus? Okay, so remember I had, so let me rewrite this formula in a slightly different way. So this just equals the Euler orbifold characteristic of the underlying space, which I know is some surface, minus, so remember I had minus m minus the sum, I plus I add on a little fractional part. So I could write that as for each cone point, I'm going to subtract pi minus 1, where this is the order of the cone point, over pi. This is the same as 1 minus 1 plus 1 over pi. This is the exact same thing. Okay, so I just do this. And what's the smallest as this could be? What's the smallest I could subtract off is 1 half. You'll notice that. But the thing is, is if this, so if this is going to be at least 2, so this is going to be less than negative 2 because I subtracted off some stuff, so that's going to be less than negative 1 over 42, so that's fine. Okay, what if I had T2? So I'm just going through these cases, and you can redo this. This is just a computation. But I want to show you how nice this overflow Euler characteristic is. 
if I had a, this equal to T2, right, then I would have zero about my formula, which I'll write over here. Overflow over characteristic of the underlying space minus the sum of PI minus 1 all over PI. So for however many current points I have. So note I said a closed orientable hyperbolic two overfold, so I don't need to worry about corner reflectors. Okay, I can do the same thing about corner reflectors, it'll just be the two-fold quotient of this, but this is a easier case to do. So if this, then, then I'm going to have zero, the, or, the or, Euler characteristic of a torus is just zero, right? And what's the least amount of thing I could subtract off here? If I had one cone point, what could I subtract off? Just a half. Okay, so the Euler characteristic of this is going to be less than negative a half, or maybe equal to if I had if I had a torus with one cone point of order two, but that's still less than negative one over forty two, so that's all fine. Okay, so that means I've got to have if this is going to go wrong, I've got to have genus zero for my underlying space. Okay, so now I need to analyze the case of genus zero. So what if I have four cone points? So now I've got two for this formula here. Uh oh, keep erasing it. Put this in a box to protect it. <laughs> so here I've got a two, this is the other characteristic of a sphere, minus some cone points. Okay, what if I have greater than four cone points? Two, I'm going to have minus a half, minus a half, this is the least I could do. And then the least I could do after that is minus one more half, okay? So I can't do more than four cone points. Okay, this is the smallest amount I could subtract for each one of them, and it's still way smaller than negative 1 over 42. Okay, so what if I had four cone points? Then I have this, okay? But this is zero, so this isn't hyperbolic. Okay, so what better could I do? Well, maybe what's the next one? If I had a cone point of order 3, then I would have 2 thirds. And I handily already calculated that, which equals negative one six, which is also less than negative one over forty two. Now you might complain that I could have a lot different examples of four cone points. There's a lot of different numbers I could put here. But all of them are going to be less than this. Okay, this is the this is the least amount I could subtract off and still have the or the characteristic be negative. Okay, with four. So if, suppose, so now it can't have four cone points. So now I'm down to, there must be three cone points if I'm going to be greater than negative 1 over 42 and still negative. Okay, so where did I do three cone points? Okay, so I claim there must be a cone point of order 2. Okay, because if not, I'm going to have 2 minus 2 thirds minus 2 thirds minus 2 thirds, which is um, equal to what? 0. Okay, or I have to change one of these numbers to negative 3 fourths. That would be the next smallest amount I could subtract off. Right? And this is equal to negative 1 twelfth, still bigger than negative 1 over 42. Okay, so I have to have a cone point of order 2. Is that okay? So if I didn't have any cone points of order 2, this is the least amount I could subtract off and be negative. That's how this game works. Okay, so now I'm going to claim um, I couldn't have two points of order 2. No. Two points of order 2. That's not allowed. Because what happens then? Then I'll have two minus a half, minus a half, I'm down to one. And whatever thing I subtract off next is going to be less than one, so it's going to be positive. So I must have one point of order two. So then I'm going to say, oh, there must be a cone point of order three. Because if there wasn't, the least amount that I could subtract off would be, um, uh, what was it, three-fourths 
minus 3 fourths, which equals 0. I couldn't have that, so the next thing would be what? 4 fifths, which equals negative 1 twentieth, which is still less than negative 1 over 42. Okay, so that means I have to have exactly one point of order 2, one point of order 3. Okay, what could the next one be? So now I've got my possibilities are S2, 2, 3. Well, I could have 3, but this is going to be Euclidean. So you just compute the Euler characteristics of each one. So this is, has positive Euler characteristic. Positive Euler characteristic. Positive Euler characteristic. Zero or other characteristic. The next one that possibly be is S2237. Okay, and this has other characteristic what? You even can guess it? Negative one over forty-two. Okay, so this discrete jumps in other characteristic allow you to get to the one with the smallest negative or before other characteristic. So here's a picture of this beautiful orbifold. These angles are, so you take two of these for a fundamental domain. Here, this picture. This is a 237 tiling. So if you want to include corner reflectors, then you just reflect this 237 orbifold. And the plane to get corner reflectors and mirrors here and that will have fundamental domain one of those triangles. Okay, let me just close one word. What did you say? Two of fundamental domain. Fundamental domain of SU237 is two, that's correct. No, I mean the two of those. Let's see. Uh, two of these triangles should be S2237. Because this should be generated by reflections in these lines. So this is a right angled orbifold here. Um, so this is a right angled reflection orbifold. Um, so these all look like corner uh, reflectors with dihedral group C2 plus Z2 there. And these are all mirrors. So I can take different structures on them. So if you're familiar with different hyperbolic structures on surfaces, the Teichner space, you can do the same thing for orbifolds. So I can take, here's one example, here's another one. All these geodesics meet at right angles. These lengths are different. This gives me a whole Teichner space for orbifolds. If you want to think of the cover, so the, all of these hyperbolic orbifolds are covered by manifolds, you can take the Teichner space of a surface that's a cover and look at the fixed point sets. The points in the Teichner space that are fixed by the group, the covering group. You can always find a regular cover. And that's the same as the type more space of the orbifold. So there's a lot of interesting open questions that you might want to do, even with two orbifolds. And I'm sorry that I went over.